Well, good morning, church. Welcome. Welcome. It's good to be here. It's good to be together. Whether you are in person here at the church or online, thank you for joining us. And um, what an important series ahead of us here. And uh, I got to be honest with you, it, it's been something I've been wanting to share for a while. I've been trying to um, wait because of the restrictions and everything going on. Um, and I'm praying for phases to continue to open. But in the meantime, we will be creative in how we get together, all right? And we will pursue uh, this important biblical command and mandate for the church to be together in close proximity and not just online. And, but we are grateful for online. We will not stop doing online. It will continue for those who feel more at peace of, of being there now for their health and their safety. And uh, hey, if you're ever not feeling well, guess what? You can watch online. That way none of us are harmed or, <laughs> or we don't bring anything in. So it works out great. <clears throat> this series is really important uh, to our church because we can't actually fulfill the vision that God has given us, the command to make disciples that make disciples, so multiplication. We can't help people follow Jesus and send them out to help people follow Jesus if they're not together learning and loving one another and showing the love of Christ and teaching the word of God. In other words, there are pages and pages and pages of scripture in the Bible that cannot be done and lived out and obeyed without being together. It's just not possible. And we're going to go through uh, quite a few of them for the next few weeks to look at the importance of three things, getting together or get together, grow together, and go together. And so today is really simple. It's the importance of getting together. And I want to give you the theological, biblical foundation of why we even gather as one church and as one body here in this fellowship together in person and as well as in our homes and our groups. So if you want to go to, uh, if you have your Bible, uh, go to Acts 2, 42 through 47. I'm also going to have on the screen for you, Acts 2, 42 through 47. <clears throat> this is about the church doing life together. These are their, the new believers. There was a revival that took place uh, in Acts chapter 2, and Peter preaches a message, and 3,000 people come to Christ, just, just men alone, so that doesn't include the, the children and women. So a move of God is happening, and the first thing they start doing is getting together. And we're going to find out what they did when they got together. So Acts 2, 42. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their, to their fellowship those who were being saved. So, we see here is all the believers devoted themselves. Devoted. When I was reading this, I just sensed that God was like, Ryan, what are you devoted to? And I thought about that for a moment. I'm devoted to God. I'm devoted to my family. I'm devoted uh, to this church, to my friends, sometimes to sleep, some food whatever. Devoted. It's a strong word, isn't it? It means commitment and time and you're all and going after it and, and uh, just devotion is faithfulness. In church, I just want to ask you a question to think about. What are you devoted to? What are you devoted to? Look at what they were devoted to. They were devoted to biblical teaching, the apostles' teaching. And at that time, it was the life of Christ, because the apostles were those who were with Christ. It was the life of Christ, and it was the Old Testament. 
They didn't even have the New Testament yet. They were making the New Testament pretty much. They were living out the New Testament at this time and were reading about their journey together. So they came together, not just at the temple or the synagogue or for us, the sanctuary, but they met together in each other's homes because guess what? That wasn't enough. Coming together at the temple wasn't enough. They were hungry. They were devoted to biblical teaching and to the apostles' testimony of what they saw in Jesus. They wanted to know everything about Jesus they could possibly find out. And then they did what we Christians like to do. They got together to eat. It's true. We like to eat. But not just to eat to eat. We can do that by ourselves. But when you come together and you sit around a table together, you get to share life and be there for one another and hear each other's stories and know what you can pray about and know how to encourage someone. And so they shared not just food together, they were sharing spiritual fellowship together. And we're going to talk about that more as the series goes on. They did communion together and prayer. They prayed so that's where you get your modern-day Bible study or home group. Biblical teaching or the Word of God, coming together to fellowship and eat, and then pray, and then pray. So right now, if you need a model for what to do when you get with someone, whether it's one, two, or more, like a group, you know what to do. You pull out the Bible, and you eat the Word of God. Whoever brings those delicious brownies that I mention like every week, you eat those. Or maybe everyone brings something to share, and you can contribute your flavor and your culture, which is really fun, actually. And then you pray for one another, and you pray for the church, and you pray for the lost. Doesn't that just sound good? Now, if, if you're an introvert, maybe that's not you, and that could be different. Maybe, maybe you don't like big crowds, so maybe your, your time is just with one or two people. I'm like 50-50, just so you know. Everyone sees me as this extrovert kind of guy. But, like, I need my alone time. Just ask my wife. If I don't get my alone time, I'm like an ogre that no one wants to be around. You know, I got to get alone. And then I, I love when I'm not with people, I actually feel empty. Like, people give me life. Are you like that? Anyone like that? Like, when I leave Bible studies and home groups, and, and when, they, when they finish, I can't even sleep because I get life from that. I, it's It's fun to me. And so some of you are like that. And some of you are like, well, I've had my, I've had my mount time to leave, you know, here's the front door and that's fine. It's just the way we've been wired. The point is, are we devoted to one another? And we see here this spiritual fellowship that was taking place. And I, and I want to show you, there's really three themes in scripture that point to this spiritual connection that we all have one, with one another. And the first one is the family of God. In Scripture, you will find Scriptures about you being a child or being a part of the family of God. And it is meant to be literal in a spiritual sense. So in other words, okay, Larry and I, we're not from the same bloodline, so to say, or are we one human race, right? But spiritually, we are family. Okay, his background, his ancestors are different than mine. But when it comes down to it, it that, that doesn't matter. What matters the most is spiritually we've been, we've been brought together, and he is my brother in Christ. He's my family member. He's in the house of God. John 1, 11 through 13 says he came to his own people. He's talking about Jesus came to the Jews, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. Wow. So every single one of us who believe in Jesus, no matter our background, become children of God. Ephesians 2.19, it says, So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. And that's why we say, welcome home. Welcome home. When you give your life to Christ, your home, you're back with your creator, you're home with your father, and guess what? You have some crazy siblings up in here. <laughs> and we're not perfect. 
okay? So when you put your faith in Jesus, you are part of the family of God. Secondly, you will read in Scripture what's called the fellowship of believers. We just read one of the main scriptures that uses the Greek word koinonia. Acts 2, through 40, uh, Acts 2, 42 through 47 is where the word koinonia is used. It's the Greek word meaning for a spiritual connection, a spiritual bond with other believers. And it takes place also in 1 John 1, 1 through 4. John the apostle... He's writing this letter to the church, and he wants them to understand how they become part of the fellowship or how they are part of this spiritual fellowship, not just locally in their area, but globally, everywhere. And this is what he says. He's talking about Jesus, and he had, see, John had been with Jesus up close, in close proximity where he could hear and touch Jesus. And this is what he says. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning. He's talking about creation whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and teach him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is life itself was revealed to us and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the father and then he was revealed to us. To us. So he's talking about his birth. He's talking about being born into the earth and living here on earth, and that's Jesus. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. So he's talking about proclaiming Jesus so that others could have fellowship because guess what? Everyone's welcome. God's front door is open for now. It is open. The gate is open. And it's time to come home. And then he goes on to say, And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may have fully share, so you may fully share our joy. It's a joy to be part of the fellowship of God. And he wants other people to experience that same joy, even if we're kind of crazy sometimes as a family. Every family has some dysfunction, right? So we belong to the fellowship of believers. And the third, by the way, that one's also literal in the spiritual sense. Okay? We are a fellowship. We are one. Now the third one is more metaphorical. Paul uses this most often in Scripture, the body of Christ. The body of Christ. This is the third one. I love this one. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 13 says, The human body has many parts. So there's the metaphor. But the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Church, it is so important that we see at this time, in this context, there were different nations. There were some that were enslaved and some that were free. And it didn't matter if they were enslaved or free, if they were a Jew or a Gentile, like a Roman or an Asian. It did not matter. What matters is, did you believe in Jesus Christ? And if so, you are one because you've been baptized into the same family by the same spirit. Wow. Wow. That transcends everything we see physically and makes us connected spiritually. He goes on to say this about the body in verses 26 through 27. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Wow. Wow. That's how connected we are, that we should mourn with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ when they are mourning. We should be glad when something good happens in our life. We should be happy instead of jealous or, or being, um, having bitterness towards them. We should show joy as well. Romans 12, 4 through 5 says, Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, did you hear that? You actually have a special role in the family of God. If you want to read the context of this more, 
I didn't have time to break down all the gifts that God has given us as the church, but you bring something special to the table. You bring something special to the family of God. And while it may not be able to be exercised on Sunday morning, we have another 166 and a half hours of the week to exercise those gifts. I think I did the math right on that. 168 hours a week. So, he says, he goes on, so it, is, so it is the Christ body. We are many parts of one body. And then it, this kind of can get a little, because you're, you know, for us. And we all belong to each other. That's what it says. You, and it's not like possession, so to say. It's more of we're just connected. We belong to one another. We belong together. We're part of the same body. And so what happens to you, church, it matters to me. And whatever happens to me, it matters to you, right? Because we belong to one another. That is the theological, biblical foundation for the reality that physically and spiritually, we are one body. We are family and we are a fellowship not just here at Calvary, but around the world. We belong to a global fellowship. Praise God. Now look around real quick because everyone around you is your family members. And as we go through this series, we're going to learn how to kind of get along sometimes, right? How we have to get along, how we grow together, and how we serve God together, how we go together. And, uh, Again, this part is, this, this series means so much to me, and it comes at such a difficult time in our world, doesn't it? But let me not jump ahead. I'll get to that. So what does this mean for us to apply it? What does it mean for us on a practical level? There's something really encouraging I want you to know. We just read that we are connected. You know what that means? You are not alone. And sometimes we might need to write that down right now. I'm not alone. We are not alone. You are not. I'm not talking about aliens and UFOs. I don't know. We'll see. No, it's okay. I'm just kidding. I thought about that when I was writing down my notes. I was like, I think I think about aliens and UFOs. Maybe. You are not alone because you're not by yourself, is what I'm trying to say. You're not alone on this journey. You are not by yourself. Isn't it awesome when you feel alone and all of a sudden you get a text message that's saying, I'm praying for you? If that hasn't happened to you, I pray it does because it's powerful. Those days where you feel alone, the enemy is making you forget truth, the truth that you're not alone, that God's with you, that the body of Christ is available if we will pursue the body of Christ as well. You are not alone. And the body of Christ will be nudged to call or text or send a message or an email or to show up at your house and say, hey, God put you on my heart. Has that happened to anyone in this room? Raise your hand if it has, because it's happened to me many times. And it always comes at the best times. And so just so you know, obey that nudge and that compelling feeling to do that. Now, if you're going to show up to our house, I recommend like a call first. Okay, that'd be a little bit more appropriate. Obey those leadings because you're not on this journey by yourself. But here's the thing. We, we listen to that and we go, you are not alone. And what do we do? We think selfishly a little bit, right? Because our human nature is Yeah, I'm not alone. I'm okay. Someone's there for me. But here's the reality. You're also there for someone else. In other words, you're not alone. So make sure you open your eyes to everyone around you because they are there for you to serve as well and love. In other words, you're not on this journey by yourself. And so we have to stop thinking only about ourselves because we're in this together. Amen. Praise God. The takeaway for this point is we have a loving responsibility, and I don't even want to use the word obligation, because it's not. It's a loving responsibility to be there for those on the journey with us. 
And there have been times where, and by the way, that begins in your home with your own family, okay? That begins, you have a loving responsibility to your children and to your spouse, to your family members who may be living with you, to love on them. They're right there. And to care for them so that they don't feel alone. But here's the thing. I have come, this is a big church, and I've been here for my whole life, 36 years. And it is easy to get lost in a large church. It's easy to be missed. I, I pray that you never feel overlooked. I pray you never feel that way. I'm not trying to dismiss anyone who has. I'm not trying to say it's your fault when I say this. All I'm trying to say is this. To be honest with you, if you look at Scripture, we all have a responsibility to show up in someone's life, which means we don't have to be alone because we're actually supposed to go to someone else. What am I trying to say? Can I just say it without you putting extra around it? I'm just saying we can't cry loneliness because we're also supposed to go to the lonely. We're supposed to go to fellowships and to groups and serve and, and be around the church. We're supposed to be at church. We're supposed to be in each other's homes. In other words, there's no excuse. We have a response. If you're feeling lonely, guess what? You also have the responsibility to go be with someone because the enemy will trap you in that loneliness. He will say, no one loves you. No one cares about you. You don't belong to any family. They can't stand you. They won't accept you. They won't hear you out. They're, that's what the enemy is going to tell you to do. Don't listen to it. He'll burn us out. He'll put the fire out. I, uh, I had a fellowship at my house years ago for our youth worship team. And I was a youth pastor here for 11 years. And I'm hanging out, and I invite their parents out. And some of them might remember this. And I invite their parents out too. And I'm like, let's, let's have a barbecue. I borrow my brother's coal barbecue. It's coal only. You got to use, you know, just charcoal. And I should have gotten some tips from him first. Because I poured... Um, the charcoal in there, and I lit it up on fire, you know, with a lots, of, lots of nice gas. I like doing that. That was fun. And I put the grill on top, you know, the, and, I, and I throw the hot dogs on and the hamburgers on, and then I close the lid, only to come back like two minutes later, and they're just burns. And I can't stand an undone hot dog on the inside or an undone burger on the inside. Like, that's, I mean, you don't even want to eat that. But there's nothing worse than a dark hot dog on the outside and on the inside it's still cold. And I didn't know what to do because I put everything on the grill. Like, I didn't have any extras. And it was like a movie. You could see everyone eating the food like, ha, huh, this is good. <laughs> it was terrible. I mean, they should have just admitted it. Order pizza. This guy needs to order pizza. I did some research after the party that you're supposed to spread, you know, the coals out, right? To like equal, like to, to spread the heat out, you know, help equalize over the entire and let it cool down for a little bit, you know? Well, I didn't do that. Now, you've heard this analogy, I'm sure, before. That if you take one coal out of that fire, it gets cold. But if you put that coal back in that fire, it gets hot again because the rest of the coal is warm. It. The devil is trying to pluck us out of being together right now. He will pluck you out like that, like a piece of charcoal. Yep. And you will feel like God's love is cold for you. You will feel like the church's love is cold for you. But the devil has effectively dismantled your connection with the church and he will make sure that you blame the church. You will blame your closest friend who never texted you, who never called you. He will do all that. He will get that in your head. And you will believe a lie when the reality is we are right here for you. We just got to show up. And I'm saying that not to get on anyone who's done it. I haven't heard that in years. So I don't have any close stories or recent stories. I'm saying that because that's what the devil does. And I'm exposing it. But right now, it's really hard to get together, isn't it? It's hard. 
And so what I'm preaching right now is counterculture, and I'm not saying disobey in a sense of just being, um, not using common sense or to be um, a jerk about what's going on in our world. What I'm saying is, is let's get together safely. Let's get together safely. And by the way, before COVID ever happened, getting together was already counterculture. Did you know that? Because we're way too busy for each other. I'm not growing. I, I, I don't know what to do. I feel alone. I need, I need answers. I need all, everything we will ask ourselves is in community. It's in togetherness. God has given your brother or sister the ability to encourage you so you won't feel like that week in and week out. He has given us people in the church who don't see any, any issues going on in the world. God bless them. That's funny, right? I mean, it's crazy. There are some people in our church, they don't see anything wrong going on, and, and maybe that's to a fault, but I think it's pretty encouraging. In other words, they see things through faith in God And they encourage me to see things differently through the eyes of God. Surround yourself with people like that. And then there's the realists like me. And sometimes you have to bring those people back into reality. And so what do we do? What am I saying? We complement each other. But there are things that we're hurting for and hungry for that is actually in fellowship that God has ordained for us to give one another. Hmm. And, and yet, we're not getting together. And that's really my next point. We feel alone if we don't make spiritual family time a priority. We need, we need our family time with our, our, our blood family, our family who lives in our household. And that's already hard enough to get, isn't it? Because we're so busy. But we need to have spiritual family time. And by the way, I guarantee you my brother right down here is not going to get a chance to ask someone way back there how they're doing and can I pray for you? Because we're not meant to just get together right now. We're meant to get together throughout the week too. You can't have quality connection just on Sunday alone. We have to make it a point to get together throughout the week. To pour into it. I'm going to get into that. I'm, I'm jumping ahead. My goodness. We need each other. We've had people contacting us saying, I need to get back to church. I feel so disconnected. I feel lonely. Loneliness is skyrocketing right now in our world. Suicides are ramping up right now in our world. Caused by loneliness. It's not good. We need each other. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw some questions out to you, and I'm, gonna, I'm asking these questions to help you see how vital it is that you have someone in your life and so that you're in someone's life. And that's why I'm going to ask you these questions. You don't have to answer. Just hear them out. Who's praying for you? Who are you praying for? And I mean like you can recall right now who you've been praying for and, and who's been praying for you. And you can even remember what they prayed for you about. So intentional prayer time with someone. Who? Who's encouraging you each week? Who are you encouraging Who are you listening to? Who's listening to you? Who are you sharing biblical truths with? Who is sharing biblical truths with you? Who's helping you grow closer to God? And by the way, who are you helping grow closer to God? Who's there to mourn with you and who are you mourning with? Who's there to help you in times of need and who are you being there for in times of need? Who are you being honest with? Who's being honest with you? Do you see? Do you see what I'm asking there? There are so many needs when we get together. Do we have someone like that in our life? I want to encourage you, church, to find someone like that. Find a group. Find two or three people. And if you can't find it, make it happen yourself. Because we, the world we're living in right now, we need that. We need someone to, to, to be real with us. We need someone to pray for us. We need someone to listen to us. We can't afford. We can't afford to be here on Sunday only and receive this important instruction right now, and that's it. We can't afford it. The devil's working full time. 
He uses 168 hours to destroy the church. Do you know that? He uses 168 hours a week to destroy the church. That's a whole week. We are on his target every day, every hour, every minute, every second. You are on his target list. We can't handle this by ourselves. We need each other. I'm just being real because I know in my life I couldn't do this by myself. Lastly, it's going to take us to be intentional to get together. It is. It's going to take intentionality because we live in a world where we're so consumed that before you know it, it's bedtime. Am I right? Before you know it, it's like time to go to bed. I'm exhausted. And we haven't checked on our brother or sister in Christ. We haven't tried to encourage them. We haven't prayed for them. We didn't send them a scripture. We didn't get with them for coffee. And that's really hard right now because no coffee shops are open inside. There is Panera. Watch, I'm going to go there this week and everyone's there. <laughs> get together intentional, intentionally. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. The famous scripture we always use when no one's coming to church. But let me use it in a different light. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So no doubt, the importance of being together, we should not neglect that. But I think in American church society, we think Sunday morning. In the Western world, are in the Eastern world, in, in Jerusalem and all that, they thought about that all the time, not just Sunday morning. If someone didn't show up to, to home group or church at the house, they were like, hey, hey, are you okay, man? Well, they, they didn't have phones, but they walked down the street and they asked, is everything all right? But here's the thing. Here's the other part I want to show you. It says in verse 24, before that, let us think of ways to motivate one another into acts of love and good works. I don't even think the church struggles necessarily to, to get together as much as, like before we, before we deal with getting together, I actually wonder, do we, are we motivated to be there for one another and motivate them and motivate each other towards love and good deeds? Like when we get together, is it more, and this is my sermon title for next week, is it more than coffee and donuts? Because this scripture says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Not to talk about our spouses. Not to talk about our fellow brothers and sisters and what they're doing wrong and how, we're, how awesome we are. I see a different verse here. It says, um, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Then it says, let us not neglect our meeting together because we need those people to motivate us to do those things. Praise God that we even have them in our corner. A takeaway that I'm out, it's out of context now, but this is the heart of this message we belong to the body of Christ spiritually, but we need to feel it physically. In church, we need each other. We need to be intentional to not forsake one another. We need to feel it physically that there's someone there for us, and we need to be together so that we can encourage one another towards acts of love and good works. Praise God. And my dream, I'm closing, I promise, My dream, hey, you're asking me to write a sermon all week and not have, you know, a little more time to share it. Let's go. God gives me a lot more than what I give you. Praise God. My dream is to see us naturally or, and or my dream is to never have to preach this message again. That's my dream. My dream is that we naturally and organically just start loving each other. Ryan doesn't, have to, Ryan doesn't have to call you to go, hey, hey, how's the group going? Or, hey, did you start your group? Or do you have a group? Or are you hanging out with people? Or, or whoever calls you? Or I would never have to even, like, 
advertise groups or advertise, here's a way to connect. We just do it. Why? Because theologically and biblically, we're connected. But we need to show it physically. We are spiritually together, but are we physically showing that together? And so the day that it would be where we don't have to orchestrate connection, you, you and I, we all, we're just there for each other. Wouldn't that be beautiful? Do you know what churches and pastors are, are having to do? They're having to plan get together so that people actually get together because that's how bad culture is right now. I'm just being completely transparent with you. We're wasting God given hours and time and money for pastors to plan get togethers because the church isn't doing what the Bible says to do in the first place. Wow, I got real right there. But you need a transparent leader right now. You need to know the truth. Because I'm watching articles and I'm watching videos of pastors coming up with schemes to get people together. And it's simply because the body of Christ isn't obeying scripture to get together. And now things are just worse because we're told not to get together. So I, my heart breaks for this. And not to be mean or mad at the church, I'm, I'm mad at the devil. I'm mad, at, I'm mad at this culture we're living in where... People are dying. Did you know that 79% of Gen Zers, that's 21, 22 or younger, 79% of them are dealing with thoughts of suicide and depression? They're disconnected. They're feeling lonely. I'm sorry, it was lonely. The statistic was loneliness. 79% are saying they feel lonely. The church needs the answer for that. We need to step up and be together and help them not feel lonely. They're connected electronically. They're not connected physically. To see and hear and feel love, the love of Jesus Christ. Well, good luck, try, good luck trying to get them to come out, Ryan. I can barely get them out of my room, out of their room. I know, that's gonna be a, that's gonna be a struggle. But it's worth the fight, it's worth the fight. So let me end with this, I'm sorry. Let me end with this. God, God's just giving me extras right now. Steps to get together. Ready for this? This one's going to be like, hey, Ryan, didn't you get a degree to give us something a little bit more in depth than that? Say hi. Say hi, yeah. <laughs> you would be amazed if you said hi to someone when you walk out of here today. It leads to something else. It's called introductions. Hi, I'm Pastor Ryan. What's your name? <laughs> My neighbors, well, I, I learned this on Right Now Media. There's a video series called The Art of Neighboring. And I totally agree with what they said in the first episode. They said, get to know your neighbor's names. That's it. That was the first lesson. I was like, I just watched this video clip for them to tell me that. But the reality is, it's true. Do you know your neighbor's name? Man, do we even know our, the names of each other? Because you're more than a number. You're a name here. God has called you by name. And so we need to look at I. By the way, I forget names. I am so sorry. I'm more of a face person. And there's so many names to remember. So I apologize in advance. Name tags are great, even though they're kind of old school. But look, get to know someone. Say hi. Get to know them. Unbusy your schedules. We're way too busy for one another. We have to get busy with each other. Okay? Just being together, caring for one another. Keep your eyes open for those who are disconnected. Okay? Have those eyes that see the way Jesus would see. Be a host for a dinner with your family or plan to go out. Get involved in a community group or a ministry here. We are launching community groups in September, even more. And if you want to help host it, let's do it. Again, I, I, I dream the day where we don't have to necessarily manage that. It is good to have accountability, though, over group leaders, right? Just so you know, some cults started from groups like that in people's homes. So there's, there's importance of accountability. But how cool would it be 
for Ryan not to have to set up lunch dates with you guys. You just do it, all right? That's what I mean. But two ways people get connected to Calvary the most, serving in a ministry or being involved in a community group. Sunday morning is actually the first part where we just get to know you. It goes deeper when we do groups and when we serve. It's, it's fact here at Calvary. It's fact. Why don't we pray together? I've gone long enough. Steps to get together. Say hi. Introduce yourself. Hang out a little longer, maybe outside today because we got to clean the sanctuary now. Get a number. Another couple near you or, or a single or some teenagers, teens, get a number. Connect. We're family. Amen. God, we thank you for this message. And Lord, I, I pray that today the church senses your heart through me. And it's not me. It's your heart. This is your word, God. And there's been damage done. But God, we will work hard. We will prevail. We will unite together. We will be together to counter the damage done. God, no one should feel alone. So help us to be there for each other. Help us to see how we need each other. Help us to be intentional. God, we want to obey your scripture to motivate one another towards love and good deeds, to not neglect meeting together in our homes or here or in restaurants, coffee shops, wherever it may be, in parks. We won't neglect those opportunities to love one another and motivate towards good deeds. That's why we're here. We thank you, God. We praise you for this message. And God, we give you all the glory. This is not about me. This is not my words. This is you, God, speaking today. And may we be careful to obey everything we've heard and, and everything that's said in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.